Welcome to this first presentation covering ERISA, HIPAA, COBRA, and other benefits law. Actually, in this presentation, we're just going to cover ERISA, but the totality of our topics are going to, uh, for this particular module, would be all of those topics. And you can see the topics listed here. We have ERISA, we have HIPAA, we have the Affordable Health Care Act, we have COBRA, and a few other statutes that we're going to look in on. Before we get started, this topic is a little bit like uh, the uh, OSHA and workers' comp topics that we had um, in another module, in that while these are important topics for HR professionals to know about, um, many of these are not ones that HR professionals are as involved with as other topics. Now this is going to vary from department to department, exactly how things are organized. Uh, in some uh, uh, HR departments, you will have specialists who just do ERISA work or just do COBRA work. In other uh, firms, uh, many of these functions will be handled by the legal department, even though there will be some HR involvement. So uh, it's going to kind of turn on, on how you do things in your particular organization. I'm not going to do a tremendously deep dive in these areas, but I am going to touch on them so you at least have some level of familiarity. Usually in these areas, you either become immersed in the topic, and you would probably know pretty soon more than I do about them, or you will end up maybe not doing very much at all, just having a familiarity with the vocabulary, for example. So I'm going to kind of give that approach because it's really not something that all HR professionals are going to become very conversant in. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, <clears throat> Let's first of all talk about the topic of what do employers have to provide in the way of health care and retirement type benefits. The short answer is nothing. Employers are not required to provide these as a general rule. Even very large employers don't have to provide them. So you may be thinking, well, why do companies bother them? It's kind of an interesting question. You have to look really at the history of our country to get a better feeling why we have connected um, employment with, um, especially with health insurance. There's not necessarily a really obvious connection between those two. I guess there is a pretty logical connection between retirement, uh, pension type benefits, and employment. After all, um, a person uh, first comes to need a pension when he or she stops working. And so there is kind of a logical connection there. But the connection between health insurance and employment is a little bit more mysterious. And it has to do with some historical developments in our country. In many Western countries, um, health insurance is handled through uh, the government, that there is oftentimes a single-payer system that's uh, created. Sometimes it's actually part of the government. Sometimes it's a, a quasi-governmental entity. Um, I'm not here to recommend or dissuade from either one of those models. It's just interesting that we in our country have chosen a different style of model. Um, when we consider kind of this history, then some related questions are, well, you say that usually this is something provided through employers, but why are employers not required to provide it for everyone? Well, the idea is it reflects kind of our, our free enterprise model that we have in our country, which is that um, employers ought to be able to design their benefits programs to attract workers as they see fit. For example, I might want to attract uh, or I might want to have a benefits package that focuses on high income, but relatively low benefits. In that situation, I might tend to attract, as employees, young workers who perhaps don't think that they really have a need for health insurance or other types of benefits. Or I might attract second income uh, people who are married to somebody who works in a traditional place with significant benefits. Because usually in those circumstances, uh, the, the uh, company that uh, or many times the, the, the employer uh, of the maybe the primary breadwinner or at least a breadwinner is able to provide insurance for all the members of the family. And so in this way, 
the um, employee is able to get the coverage that she or he needs through the, the spouse's employment and yet can enjoy perhaps higher wages because uh, the, the whole bundle of things that the employer is providing doesn't have so much of the uh, benefit side. Because, you know, benefits become quite a significant portion of the um, income that is paid to an employee. Many employers think about it being uh, 30 or even 35 percent of the total income that is provided to an employee. So maybe an employee is paid $100,000. Well, the employer is probably going to end up paying 130, maybe even $135,000 in a combination of benefits and um, taxes uh, as part of that compensation package. Now, of course, there are certain things that the employer is required to contribute for. For example, employers required to contribute uh, for a towards Social Security and Medicare for the employees. Um, and many times you'll see this on your pay stub listed as FICA, which stands for Federal Insurance Contributions Act. Also, employers are required to pay unemployment insurance. Um, and also workers' comp. Again, we're assuming that we're in a, in a state that that either requires employers to participate or this particular employer has chosen to be a subscriber. So these are kind of non-optional categories of, of participation. But the, the health care and the pension plans are not required. Now, you might think to yourself, well, Groover, you're a little bit behind the times here because, after all, uh, there's that Affordable Health Care Act, which or Affordable Care Act, which is oftentimes called Obamacare. You may have heard it referred to that way. Doesn't that require large employers to provide health insurance? Well, yes and no. Uh, no, yes, in the sense that it provides strong motivation for large employers to do so. Um, large employers also always had motivation in terms of trying to uh, attract and retain the most uh, skilled, uh, smartest, hardest working workers. But uh, the Affordable Health Care Act, excuse me, Affordable Care Act certainly increased the incentive for that. But it did not require it. What it did was it applied a tax to um, employers who chose not to provide those benefits. Now, employers, you know, probably thought to themselves, well, gosh, I'd rather give the money to my employees than to give the money to the government. And so I'm sure that there were employers out there who chose, who maybe have been reluctant to provide health insurance before, but now have decided to make the change. Um, so that is... Um, uh, kind of where it, where it lies. And so, yes, most large employers do provide health insurance and some type of retirement benefit, but many small and even not so small companies aren't uh, doing that at this time. So let's talk a little bit about ERISA. ERISA stands for Employee Retirement Income Security Act. Now, given this name, you're probably thinking to yourself, well, this just must have to do with pensions and 401ks and things like that, right? I mean, that seems to be the topic that we're focusing on. Uh, the name is a little bit misleading, though, because this has to do also with other benefits that an employee would, would might be participating in. So a good way to see this is the benefits law. This law went into effect, I believe, in 1973. Let me just double check that. I think I might have that on the next slide. Let's see. Actually, I don't have it in the next slide. Oh, here we go, 1973, so I was right. So we've had this law for a very long time. Uh, it, uh, well, well, first of all, before we go into the specifics, this is kind of the outline of what we're going to be covering in this module. We're going to talk about ERISA, and we'll see um, over half of the material that we're going to be covering is about ERISA. This is the big topic in this particular chapter. Then we'll talk a little bit about HIPAA. HIPAA stands for the Health Insurance Portability and Accounting Act. You can see it's the word HIP and then AA. And then this is the, uh, um, which is oftentimes called the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare. The actual name of the statute is Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. So it's PPACA, I guess. But again, I'm probably going to call it Obamacare or Affordable Care Act. I'm, if I say Obamacare, I don't mean it in either a positive way or a negative way, just kind of as a descriptive term that people kind of identify with it. Our next statute that we'll talk about is COBRA. Uh, the name COBRA doesn't really suggest anything to have to do with health insurance, but neither, neither does the official name of the statute. I'm not going to ask you to know this official name because, gosh, when you hear it, you're like, what does that have to do with health insurance? 
Consolidated Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act. Um, I'm not quite sure. Obviously, this was part or part of a larger bundle of uh, of, uh, of a statute that involved lots of different categories of material, but it's called COPRA, and we'll go through kind of what's involved in that, and then we'll talk about a few other things. But to, for this first presentation, we're going to focus on ERISA. We're going to talk first of all general introduction. We're going to talk about the uh, employer requirements, uh, especially the requirements that an employer act as a fiduciary. And then we'll talk about the topic of pensions. Again, ERISA isn't restricted to pensions, but certainly pensions and 401ks and the like are a big topic under ERISA. So let's get started. What does ERISA require? Well, first of all, again, ERISA is the Employee, employee uh, Retirement Income Security Act. It covers pensions broadly, doesn't just apply to, excuse me, covers benefits broadly, just doesn't apply to pensions. And it was in response to some actions that employers did uh, back in the late 60s and early 70s where employers uh, raided pension funds and left a worker sometimes holding the bag. They were counting on getting this pension and suddenly the money wasn't there. Obviously, many times when this would happen, the workers might have been at the end of their earnings capacity. They were senior people who really didn't have the capacity to continue to work for many more years. So it created a lot of upheaval and uh, uh, difficult circumstances for lots of people. And so this particular Particular law was designed to address that issue. And again, it's going to look at benefits in two different ways. The first benefits is pretty intuitive. Uh, pension plans, that's one category of, of plans that, the, that ERISA talks about. The other welfare plans is a much broader term. I guess the first thing to say is that welfare here doesn't refer to any kind of government program uh, that we might talk about, for example, welfare benefits or something like this. This is a, a benefit that the company is providing. It has nothing to do with government involvement. And it's really everything other than pension. So it's going to cover things like medical insurance. It's going to cover things like sick pay. Um, it's going to cover things like accident and disability and insurance products. It's going to cover potentially unemployment benefits, although that's going to be statutory too, so this would be on top of that. It could cover things like vacation benefits, oftentimes called PTO or paid time off benefits. It may even cover things like apprenticeships and other training programs. Uh, some employers have daycare centers, um, uh, maybe scholarship funds, prepaid legal services, severance pay also can be part of these types of plans. So really there's a whole range of things and this isn't even an exhaustive list of when an employer wants to give a certain benefit to an employee, very often they choose to do it through an ERISA plan. Now are employers required to do any of these things? No they aren't. Uh, but it, let's say an employer chooses to give one of these benefits. Is the employer required to do it through ERISA, through this statutory uh, schema? Usually not. Usually the employer can choose to do it through ERISA or just choose to do it uh, separately from it. So you may say, well, why would an employer choose to do it through ERISA? One of the big reasons is that there are certain tax advantages. If an ERISA plan uh, if an, uh, a benefit is structured in a way that satisfies the requirements of ERISA, very likely the employer is going to get some tax breaks. And that's a very, very motivating thing for employee, employee employers. Let's stop here for a second and talk a little bit about ERISA generally. Um, when I was, when I started my practice uh, back, uh, I guess in 1990, when I started practicing actively, my um, first job was at a law firm. It was a very large law firm. And um, uh, there was a, 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 de a department, a, a tax department um, in this particular law firm. There was probably I don't know, 30 plus attorneys in the department and virtually all of the uh, income tax attorneys were male. Uh, this again, this is, is uh, quite a while ago, but still it was kind of su surprising how, what a heavy level of uh, tax attorneys were male. And uh, since that time, I have continued to see that for whatever reason, males typically are more drawn to income tax work than um, than females are, and it's a pretty strong tendency that continues to this day. But in many uh, 
tax groups, there is kind of a subset, and that is oftentimes the ERISA practice. The employee benefits practice is sometimes what it's called. Now, you might think to yourself, well, why is the, the employee's benefits practice, why isn't that part of the HR department within a law firm? Well, sometimes it is. It can be housed in either place, but I would say more commonly, or at least as commonly, it's housed in the a tax department. And the reason for that is that the designing of uh, ERISA plans or employee benefits plans is largely driven by the IRS tax code. And so that's an important thing to keep in mind. Employee benefits are very closely associated with getting those tax benefits. That's an important topic. Well, aside issue with with the with the ERISA uh, department wherever it happens to be located the, the tax department or some other uh, part of a law firm that department is almost always females female attorneys it's almost overwhelmingly female attorneys so it's interesting that in the same department you'll have all the males doing income tax work and all the females doing ERISA work so why is there that uh, difference I think that there's kind of two reasons for it. The first reason perhaps is that women are more drawn to HR matters. Maybe there's that uh, nurturing side of things. Um, not that men can't be nurturers, but uh, you know, maybe a cultural assumption that women enjoy um, uh, relationship stuff and you know, taking care of, of people through having benefits. Perhaps there's some idea along those lines, whereas maybe the, the men are more maybe number crunchers or at least more oriented in that way. Again, all very unfair generalizations, but there may be a, a grain of truth to that. Um, but there's another important reason why ERISA work attracts women, um, probably more commonly than men, and that is ERISA has a reputation not for being easy work, not for being especially fascinating work, but it does have a reputation for being very steady work. There's not a lot of hard deadlines. I mean, April 15th comes, you got to file those income tax returns. You got a trial coming up, you got to be ready that morning of trial. Um, there are other deadlines in corporate work and other areas where you have these hard and fast dates and when you're coming up on it, you're not sleeping. You're working 24 seven to make those deadlines if you're in a large law firm. ERISA work has, I mean, the attorneys in that area are busy oftentimes, quite busy oftentimes, but it's a much more steady flow. And so as a result, this allows a little bit more work-life balance. Obviously, men want work-life balance just like women, but uh, for stereotypical reasons or whatever, it just so happens that women are more interested or willing in expressing that preference, uh, maybe because they're the ones who give birth or things along those lines. But for whatever reason, I think the work-life balance um, issue is one of the reasons why women are more attracted to ERISA work. Now, none of this has anything to do with uh, how the HR function is divided up, because I don't think uh, women are more likely to do ERISA work in a in a, uh, a HR department. We're talking strictly about the, the the legal department staffing. It's not really an HR staffing issue. But don't be surprised if you are working with ERISA attorneys that you find they're almost all women, and when you work with the uh, tax attorneys, they're usually men. Um, just a little side note here. Uh, here we go. Let's go to the next one. Um, ERISA law is unusual among employment laws because it has very sweeping preemption language. It's even more sweeping than we see with OSHA. Um, you know, we talked about under Title VII and the Americans with Disabilities Act and the Age Discrimination Employment Act. In those stat, in a Fair Labor Standards Act, FMLA, Family and Medical Leave Act, we see in the, all those statutes that the government says we're setting a floor. States can do more. States can have more protected characteristics. States can um, have uh, more benefits, more weeks of, of leave or whatever. States just can't have less. And so this is the, the floor that we're providing. A state doesn't have to provide more, but a state can provide more. In the area of ERISA though, we see a very, very strong preemption. And that means really states can't legislate in this area at all. This is another reason why employers oftentimes do develop ERISA programs. For example, imagine, well, I'll get, this is a good example. Um, there are some states that legislate how uh, vacation pay will be paid. Um, 
one way that it can be paid, and this isn't, uh, this is just one way, there's other ways too, but one way it can be paid is that an employee has to still be employed by an organization, by the company, on a magical date. And on that date, that employee is going to have deposited in his or her account however many weeks of vacation he or she's entitled to. Let's assume at this particular place of employment that the employee is scheduled to get two weeks of vacation for that year. Well, it may be that he gets, or she, we'll say he, just so we can keep the pronouns straight, he is going to get two weeks of vacation on January 1st. If he quits effective January 29th, excuse me, uh, December 29th, he doesn't get those two weeks of pay because he quit too early. If he quits January 2nd, he gets those two weeks of pay. So it's kind of an all or nothing thing. It's like a, a light switch flip, flipping one way or the other. For um, employers, that can be whether the employee chooses to quit on a certain date or whether the employee is terminated by a certain date. You can see in that em environment, employees are usually reluctant to leave right before that, that magical date. I mean, they want to get paid that amount of money. They feel like they've already, kind of in some sense, earned it. In some states, that it is not uh, the, 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 the legislature has concluded that this isn't a good policy, that employers shouldn't be permitted to have this kind of deposit happen on a given date. And so they may require the employer to accrue the benefits. And especially, this is especially true in situations where uh, maybe the employee is being dismissed or perhaps resigning. And so the the uh, the the employer is in those states required to pay a portional amount. So again, going back to my example of Bob, he is quitting effective December 29th. Well, he's virtually worked all the way to January 1, and so if he was gonna get 10 days of vacation, he probably ought to have you know at least nine plus days paid out to him at that time if he lives in one of these states that, re that requires the employer to pay out that amount of money. Um, of course, the employer may have designed the uh, vacation system to encourage people to stick around. So you might actually have the date that uh, the uh, uh, vacation becomes deposited right after a period of time where you're expecting the office to be very busy and you want to make sure people aren't leaving so you're not going to be shorthanded during that busy time. So it might have been strategic on the part of the employer to delay that accrual date until after that peak time has come and gone. Uh, but if the but if this legislature has said, no, we don't want that in our state, then the employer is going to be required, obviously, to follow the statute. Except if the vacation pay plan is an ERISA plan because of the preemption language. And so what happens is in those states, in the states that I know that have this type of policy, are Illinois and California, there may be others, but um, what happens is that employers who happen to have businesses in those states or have units in those states, and they don't like that policy, and it's important enough to them that they not uh, uh, pay out under those terms, they may, uh, take their uh, vacation pay plan and turn it into an ERISA plan. And if that happens, then they no longer have to comply with that state law because of that preemption language. They had to comply with it when they didn't make it, an, when it was not an ERISA plan, but now they, they don't have to. So that's an additional reason why sometimes things become ERISA plans, even if perhaps there aren't tax law benefits for, with respect to that. So again, um, the uh, ERISA statute really preempts uh, virtually all state laws if the uh, plan that is developed is qualified to become an ERISA plan. And again, the reason for this, why is there this level of preemption? Um, I don't know historically what happened in 1973. My guess is, though, that it was a compromise between various members of the Senate and House of Representatives. You know, there's a give and take, kind of a bit of horse trading that happens in the legislative process. Uh, some conservatives give in this area, some liberals give in this area to reach a compromise. And exactly where the compromise is gonna pan out who's going to win, who's going to lose, who's going to give here, who's going to give there, uh, varies from statute to statute, varies depending upon the legislation, le legislature, 
the legislation, uh, the circumstances that are happening at that time. And at this time, for whatever reason, the idea of preemption was considered something that maybe the, uh, and I'm guessing it was the more liberal members were willing to, to give up on. And you can see that it does help with uh, standardization. A large employers lots of times find it much easier if they can have one set of benefits for all their workers. Imagine, for example, the year Walmart. You're in all 50 states. It's a hassle to have 50 different vacation plans and 50 different health care plans and 50 different retirement plans. That not only involves hassles because probably you have workers moving from one state to another on a pretty regular basis. So there's lots of transitions in and outs of various programs. There's lots of paperwork associated with that if you have to have all these different plan documents. So it involves a fair amount of expense and hassle and you're not really getting a lot of benefit for your workers or for the corporation under those circumstances. And so you can see how it's nice, it's clean, it's easy. You get to take advantage of some of the economies of scale of being a Walmart when you can have a one-size-fit-all type approach. The statute ERISA itself is a pretty darn complex law. It has four titles. We're going to focus on Title I in this presentation. Not really going to touch on the others, but I want to let you know about Title II. And this is the one that talks about how you get the tax goodies. Um, and we're, again, we're not going to talk about that because it's kind of beyond the scope of this presentation. But if you do decide at some point that you really enjoy the, the tax code side of it, and that's especially uh, a path you may be interested in if you, are, for example, are paralegal who is attracted to employment law and to uh, benefits law that this could be an area that you might want to uh, grow your practice into um, but we're not going to touch on it uh, today okay so let's go forward from here I'm not even going to talk about this case it's just kind of provided as an FYI I won't test you on the holdings here I'm not I'm also not going to test you on this one again we're not going to do the the deep dive into the nitty-gritty of these types of statutes and I'm also not going to touch base on this one. So we're getting some passes here. Go forward. And so now we're going to talk about employer requirements. What do employers have to do under ERISA? And the big focus is going to be on fiduciary duties. Okay, so this is what Title I, we just said, you know, that's the focus of this particular uh, lecture. We're not going to uh, do talk any more about two, three, or four. So it's all about Title I here. What does it require that employers do? Well, the first thing is it requires or it requires employers to advise employees regarding the benefits they offer. So the employers have to tell the employees what the employees are entitled to do uh, or to take advantage of. Obviously, if you don't know that you have vacation pay, then you don't take vacation pay. So it's a pretty sensible requirement. Then the employer has to deliver those promised benefits again pretty obvious it's kind of you know, if you if you say you're going to give Bob two weeks of vacation you have to give Bob two weeks of vacation I mean you, you know you, you can't make you know you, it's not a situation where you make Bob take it I mean Bob doesn't want his vacation you aren't required to force him to do it but uh, the idea is you don't have to give Bob vacation but if you tell him he's got it and he tries to take it you got to let him have it Employers also need to be able to provide a claims process and an appeals process. This is especially appropriate and necessary in the healthcare area. You have a, an employee who's been diagnosed with a serious illness. Uh, she wants treatment X. The insurance declines that treatment. Well, she needs to have a process um, and a, a system in which she can challenge that decision. Um, and if, hopefully for her, if she, if, you know, if it's appropriate, that is the decision is going to be overturned. And so there needs to be that type of check on that initial decision. The employer also has to manage the benefits wisely and for the benefit of its employees. And this is a fiduciary duty. We will talk more about this. The money that goes into these ERISA plans is not the company's money to do with as it wishes. It's for the benefit of the employees. Not so much different than the wages that the employer pays to the employee. You know, once the employer gives me my paycheck, the employer doesn't get a vote about what I do with the money. Similarly, once the employer tells me, hey, I'm gonna give you this health insurance, then it's, it may have some control over the Money simply because somebody's got to watch the money but it's supposed to be focusing on how we're going to help make Gruber's life better because she has this benefit 
and there shouldn't be any kind of interference with or retaliation against the beneficiaries of the poem, the employees who are taking advantage. So you, you can't have a system in which, say, you know, Bob um, gets sick and he uses a lot of health insurance. Well, the employer can't say, hey, Bob, you know, you're, you're using too much health insurance these days. We don't like that. We're going to fire you because you're just too expensive to maintain. That would be an example of retaliation, which is prohibited under ERISA. Okay, so let's go forward from here. Summary plan descriptions. SPDs are what these called. Um, uh, people in uh, the legal departments of, of law firms and also, uh, or assuming the ERISA departments of law firms and legal departments in a corporation, uh, those who do ERISA type of work spend a fair amount of their time uh, preparing summary plan descriptions and other descriptions that are filed with the uh, Department of Labor. Um, and these, uh, I have some examples here. I'm just going to show you a few right now. We'll look at the Chevron one first. There's kind of two philosophies about this. Here we go. Let me pull up. Um, actually, let's do uh, the Phillips one first. This is the Phillips one. You can see it's 376 pages. Not so sum summary, is it? And you can see it's it's kind of a, a one package thing. It covers lots of different categories: um, uh, severance, uh, disability, life insurance. It doesn't cover uh, retirement. It doesn't look like, although it does cover retiree medical. Um, so it's a pretty lengthy document, and you can see it is a little bit um, kind of. A, a, Attractive, we'll see some pictures going forward. Lots of different information. They, they make it a little bit colorful. Um, but it's a, uh, maybe we'll get to some pictures. I think I saw some pictures earlier. I don't want to oversell it and make it sound too splashy, but it's designed to, um, to be a hopefully user-friendly, employee-friendly, written in a style that's going to make it relatively easy for the employee to understand what his or her benefits are, what the processes are, what's covered, what's not, how to access those benefits. And again, I'm not going to do the whole thing. Um, here's the one from Chevron. This is the Chevron page where you can pull up summary plan descriptions. You look at these two people, they are thrilled to look at the benefits that they are entitled to as Chevron employees. I'm just going to pull up one. You can see they have theirs separated into different categories. They have them for lots of different uh, uh, groupings and they have them for uh, retirement and disability. So they've chosen to, to keep their separate. Their plans, I think I might have the medical as the one that I pulled up. Their plans are a little bit less colorful, a little bit less slick looking, more legal-ish, but they're still gonna be written in a, a style that is relatively easy for, an, although they do have some pictures in here, relatively easy, she's thrilled with this. She must be getting awesome benefits. Again, here we have a picture of a cigarette. They don't want people to be smoking, so they're trying to discourage that. Anyway, these are just kind of examples of what they look like. You can see our section, do I need to find a new dentist? Well, it tells you some information about that. What's my enrollee ID? Um, what if I'm getting orthodontic treatment right now in the middle of, of my process here? Um, so there's lots of information here about uh, various and sundry aspects of these types of programs. So let's go back to the PowerPoint. So those are two examples of uh, summary plan descriptions. Gives you a flavor for how those might um, be prepared. So if you have an interest in benefits and you are somebody who enjoys writing, that could be an area that you could get involved with. Whether you're a legal professional or not, that can certainly be an area. And one of the things that summary plan descriptions need to uh, avoid is legalese. They should be written so that the average person, the average employee can read them. Many times these type of documents strive for about a ninth grade reading level uh, so that they, uh, I mean, they're not going to read, uh, they're not going to be fascinating, they're not going to read like a murder mystery novel, but they should use relatively short sentences, relatively uh, simple words. 
but as, as important as writing it simply is writing it comprehensively. It needs to be accurate and it needs to inform the employees about their rights, certainly, and also their obligations. So the things that the SPD have to identify is who is the plan administrator, how do you become eligible to participate in the various benefits, what benefits actually are offered, how do you go about claiming those benefits, and if you're denied, how do you go about appealing those denials? So it's, a, it's a, an important legal document that's really going to uh, establish the relationship and how that relationship will go forward from an insurance perspective or from a benefits perspective. Um, ERISA does not require employees to establish any of these particular programs, but what it does is if the employer decides to establish an ERISA plan, it tells the employer, hey, you have to meet these certain th thresholds. And as I said before, employees can do not, excuse me, employees can sue if they're denied benefits. The uh, plan administrator then decides whether to uh, accept their denial or to, to continue the denial or to reverse the denial. And the administrator has to follow the plan documents and has to follow what the standard is established in the plan documents. Let me go back to this thing. Um, as we said before, employers must provide reasonable claims processing as well as reasonable claims procedures. Um, and employees uh, can't sue until they have exhausted those procedures. So you can't uh, just say, oh, I'm, I'm un unhappy because I was denied of the particular treatment that I wanted, well, you have to actually go through that process that's established in the SPD, file the claims, go through, there may be several different levels of appeals. And of course, at the end of the process, if you are denied, then you can sue. But you also need to be aware that it's an abuse of discretion standard. The courts are not very inclined to overturn a plan administrator's decision that your particular request for benefits was it should be overturned. I mean, it happens, but it's a challenging uh, threshold for an employee to be successful with. Let's now talk a little bit about the requirement that employees be, or excuse me, the employer, the plan administrator be a fiduciary. A fiduciary is an important legal term. We uh, use this term often in the law, and we haven't used this term, I don't know if we've ever used this term in this course before right now, so this is kind of a bit of new vocabulary. What is a fiduciary? Someone who has discretionary authority over investment or management decision of plan assets on behalf of others. This isn't a really good definition because it's really specific to an ERISA fiduciary. Um, this might be a better one here. Um, one who exercises discretion or control. Well, actually, this isn't any better either, but it, it's certainly, it's a definition that's very applicable to the particular type of fiduciary that we're focusing on. Um, it's somebody who is managing something for somebody else. And so, you know, if, if you leave me your dog, for example, for the, uh, maybe I'm dog sitting for you, um, and you tell me, hey, you know, Fido should be fed, you know, at 7 a.m. in the morning and 7 a.m. at night, and he needs to be walked, you know, three times during the day for at least uh, 20 minutes each time. Um, those are what I'm supposed to do. You're not there. Fido isn't going to be able to tell you whether I did any of that stuff. And so what I might do is I might just give Fido all of his food um, at 7 a.m. and leave him in the backyard and not walk him a bit. And guess what? You won't know. Fido won't be able to tell you. Um, I would have abused my fiduciary role, though. I'm supposed to do what you want me to do. And um, that was wrong of me not to do that. Well, the same thing here. When you are the fiduciary of an ERISA plan, you are supposed to, to take the position of the employees, um, the group of employees, first. Now, let's think about this for a second. So Bob... Um, he has uh, an illness, and there's two effective treatment approaches to this illness. One is going to cost the plan $10,000. Another is going to cost the plan $100,000. Bob wants to go with the $100,000 plan, uh, but it doesn't seem to be any more medically advisable than the $10,000 plan. Now, if all you were worried about was making Bob happy, you'd go for the $100,000 plan. 
But if you have, if you pay $100,000 for Bob, then that means you have less money for Sally. And maybe as a result of making that large payment for Bob, that means you're not going to have an, as much money for other people. So you have to consider not just Bob when you make this decision, but the whole population of people. Is paying up, paying out a large uh, payment for Bob going to challenge the solvency of the ERISA plan? And so you're thinking about the totality, but what you're not thinking about is the employer. You're not thinking, well, gosh, the employer would really like Bob to get back to work earlier, and so you know he can get back to work earlier if he does the ten thousand dollar plan, or this will really save the employer money because the employer is, after all, paying for all of this. That shouldn't be what's focusing what the plan administrator is thinking about. So let's look at what the fiduciary duties are. Managing the, these assets solely for the benefit of the beneficiaries and with discretion. So not considering the employer situation. For pension plans, the fiduciary needs to diversify assets, monitoring performance, and refraining from transactions that raise a conflict of interest. So you don't want your pension plans to be invested heavily, say, in company stock or in just one industry. You want it to be balanced um, so that um, if there's an upturn or downturn in the economy, your a, a portfolio is going to be, be well managed, to be wisely invested. And then, of course, as a fiduciary, you're required to provide accurate information and to disclose material facts to um, uh, the, the employee so that they know uh, what's going on and what the rules are relating to the program. So these is kind of a little uh, scheme about what the actual duties are. Duty of loyalty to the plan participants. Exclusive purpose is for the benefit of the em in, uh, employees. Prudence, so being wise, not investing all in one product. Diversification, again, investing broadly. Uh, compliance with plan documents. Do what you say you're going to do in the plan documents. So those are the things that we look for uh, for a fiduciary in the area of ERISA. We're not going to look at this statute either. We'll go forward from here. I mean, not the statute, this case. Um, so don't you don't feel like you need to know the LaRue case. And you also don't need to know the Metropolitan Life case. These are cases I talk about sometimes in other, other courses that I teach. OK, so let's talk about refraining from interference. Let me go back here and just kind of do a summary of where we were when we were talking earlier. I hear. So we've talked about. The, all of these topics, advising employees about the benefits, which we would do this in the SPD, delivering the benefits, uh, providing the, uh, a claim process and a, a appeal procedure. We talked about this being in the fiduciary duty, and now we're up to our last requirement, which is don't retaliate against beneficiaries who use the benefits. So ERISA prohibits discrimination against a beneficiary. And when you say discrimination, you know, the term discrimination is kind of one of those loaded words. Let me pause and, and let's just reflect upon the word discrimination first. You and I discriminate all the time. And it's actually a good thing. Um, I happen to discriminate against peas. I just don't like them. Um, I would much prefer to eat broccoli or cauliflower or green beans than a pea. In fact, I just won't eat them because they're nasty. I discriminate against them. I discriminate against my students. Students who answer all of the questions on the test get a higher grade than students who miss some questions. And in fact, the more questions you miss on my test, the lower your grade is going to be. So I am discriminating against students who score or who get fewer questions right. And so we, so we discriminate all the time and that's good. We discriminate when we're shopping, for example. Maybe we are trying to decide whether we're going to buy that high quality uh, set of sheets or the middle quality set of sheets or the inexpensive set of sheets. We distinguish between those. Maybe we choose the cheap ones because we don't care about having fancy sheets and we like the fact that the price is lower. But to discriminate means to discern a difference and to take that difference into account. In our culture we have though tended to use the word discriminate to refer to a situation in which a person is 
seeing a distinction that doesn't have any merit in terms of how that person ought to be treated. So um, while it makes sense to distinguish between workers, let's say I happen to have two workers, Bob and Larry. Bob's always at work in time. He's always focused on doing his task. He has high skills. Larry's routinely late or he doesn't come to work at all. He isn't very focused when he's at work and his skills are not as good. It's appropriate and reasonable for me to discriminate against Larry to prefer Bob, to pay Bob more money, to retain Bob's services, and maybe let Larry go. That is discrimination. It's perfectly lawful, and it's a good idea. So when I use the word here, when I say ERISA prohibits discrimination, I mean it in that sense that we ordinarily mean it, which means making distinctions that shouldn't be made. So again, let's going back to my example, let's say that Bob is a Caucasian and Larry's African American. Well, if I prefer Bob because he's Caucasian, or if I prefer Larry because he's African American, uh, that's a, a a discrimination asserting a difference but it's one that I'm not permitted to use in considering the quality of the work or uh, the pay or other benefits that this particular employee ought to have and the reason the law prohibits that is because it's not relevant to how good a worker this particular person might be. So let's go back and look at our question. ERISA prohibits discrimination against a beneficiary for exercising any benefit right to which he or she is entitled or to which he or she may become entitled. We actually talked about this a little bit in the disability area. Imagine that we are considering uh, hiring two different workers, Samantha and Louise. They're both qualified, they'd both make good workers, but it ends up that Louise is wheelchair bound and she's a wheelchair user and we don't really maybe know the specifics but we're guessing that she may have some continuing health care issues uh, because of the fact that she's a wheelchair user. She's probably going to need to visit the doctor more often. She may have other needs that are going to increase her use of the insurance that we would be providing to her under the company benefits. So if we were to stop and say, gosh, Louisa would be good, Samantha would be good, but we think Louisa is going to be more expensive. And even if we're, we're sure, even if we're right about that analysis, that's not a lawful analysis for, we to, for us to make. Now, at the time when we were in the Americans with Disabilities Act, I said that the Americans with Disabilities Act prohibits that analysis. And that's true. But also ERISA would prohibit that type of analysis. Now, this type of discrimination is not irrational. I mean, uh, discrimination based upon a person's religion or their race or their national origin or their gender is usually pretty irrational. I mean, after all, I can be as good an attorney if I'm an African American as if I'm an, a Caucasian or Asian American. I can be as good an attorney if I'm a woman as if I'm a man. But in this case, the employer is discriminating or making distinctions based upon how expensive I'm going to be for the plan. And that is not very nice, but it is a logical distinction to make. I mean, why wouldn't you want to pay less for something rather than more for something? But even though it makes logical sense that the employer would want to, quote unquote, discriminate in this way, it's prohibited. The employer can't consider the benefits costs that an employee might have um, in, in, in most cases. Okay, but even though we have this protection um, against discrimination, I don't want to oversell it because Generally, this protection against discrimination has been interpreted narrowly by courts, and it only applies when uh, the, the uh, discrimination was for the express purpose of def defeating the rights to various benefits. So the rule is employers must not discharge or discriminate against employees because they have used benefits to which they are entitled or they discriminate to prevent them from using benefits for which they're entitled. If it's only one of the many factors that was used in the decision, it's probably not going to violate the law. So it has to be a pretty a kind of a cutthroat approach by the employers. Hey, you know, we, we, we see that you've been, uh, you know, using all those cancer benefits and oh, we don't want you to continue to use those benefits because they're expensive for us. So we're going to cut you off that type of thing. Um, that would be unlawful. So now let's talk about pensions. 
So pensions, of course, are benefits that are uh, being accrued during the employment relationship, but won't actually be paid out in most cases until after the employment relationship ends. And in some cases, the benefit won't be paid out at all until significantly after the employment relationship ends. So let's imagine that I'm working for, say, Walmart, and let's say they have a defined uh, benefit program that I participated in and um, I leave their employment when I'm 50 years old. Well, it's very likely that I won't actually start uh, participating in the, ben the pension until I'm 60 or maybe even older than that. And so it doesn't necessarily stop even right or start right after I leave the employment. Although sometimes it, it, it will, depending upon the age in which I leave. So let's consider here the issue of vesting. Pension plans must vest after a certain amount of time, resulting in a non-forfeiture right to a pension. And this is an important idea because when people are looking to pensions, um, they are counting on that money being there because if the money is withdrawn, and keep in mind this is why ERISA was originally drafted, if a person's thinking, oh, you know, I'm working for Walmart or whatever the company is, I'm accruing this benefit, when I reach 65 or whatever my retirement date is, I'm going to have this money, um, I'm, I'm, I'm also going to maybe have Social Security and maybe some other savings, but this is an important part of my retirement plan. And then that person gets to the age of 65 and, well, they have Social Security, they've got the little bit of money they say, but the, the big thing that they were hoping to have that doesn't pan out. Well, it's too late for that employee to go back in time and work for a different company or make different arrangements. So because of the nature of the benefit, it's really important that the um, uh, employer really have that locked down. Um, so that the money is going to be safe and going to be available. And so an important concept here is the idea of vesting. Vesting means to become legally entitled to receive a benefit that cannot be forfeited if employment is terminated. Um, employers have to uh, permit people, again, if you're going to have an ERISA retirement plan, you have to allow your employees to start participating in it um, by at least one year after employment has begun. You can't have a, a waiting period longer than that. Now, vest, vesting isn't going to be 100% at that time, but you have to allow that participation to begin. So let's consider the scenario of Bob. So Bob's a 22-year-old delivery truck driver for Giraffe Delivery Company. He's been excluded from the pension plan in spite of having worked continuously for the company for the last six months. Uh, under these facts, Bob's exclusion is legal because he's only been there six months. He hasn't met that one-year threshold. And so um, as long as Giraffe will let Bob start participating by his one-year anniversary, then um, it would be lawful under those circumstances. Uh, ERISA has an anti-cutback rule that prohibits employers from reducing the benefits if the employee has already accrued it. Now, the employer can turn it off for new hires, um, but it can't discontinue it for employees who are already uh, committed to, to that plan. So it can be modified or discontinued for new employees, but not for the ones who are already participating in it. So we have some key terms here. I'm going to focus on these bottom two, a defined contribution and defined benefit plan. Defined contribution plan, excuse me, defined benefit plans are the old style type of pensions uh, that employers uh, provided in the past. They are much less common today, unfortunately, for employees than they once were. In this type of system, the employer says, listen, I'm going to pay you some amount of money um, on a monthly or annual basis once you retire. And that calculation will be based upon your, either your last five or 10 years of income, uh, multiplied by the number of years of service typically is what happens. So it's, uh, the employer is saying how much he's gonna pay the employee. Um, so the employee can pretty much count on this is how much the money's gonna be. Now, how much that money will actually be worth, the employee can't know because he doesn't know what the inflation rate's gonna be, but he's gonna know what the payment every month is gonna be. So this is good for employees, but it's difficult for employers because um, it, it's difficult to make plans to, to maximize those 
uh, or to, to make sure that you have enough money in this category. What the employers prefer nowadays is to define contribution plan. In this system, what the employers does is sets up a way for the employee to regularly contribute to his or her retirement. Sometimes employers match, sometimes employers don't. That's an option that the employer has. So in this plan, it, the, the contribution amount is defined by the, oftentimes by the employee, and it's really up to the employee within the scope of the plan to decide how he or she is going to invest the money. And if he or she is savvy and invests wisely, then there may be lots of money available at retirement. If he or she is not savvy or perhaps just unlucky, there may be relatively little money available. And so there's a lot more uncertainty for that worker as to exactly how much money he'll have at the retirement date. Um, so this is kind of a, a bit of a definition. So here's a kind of another uh, more, uh, uh, more d definition about a defined benefit plan. In this type of plan, the is employer assumes the risk. And because of this, plans are under greater scrutiny. Let's assume that the employer isn't very good at doing this. Well, you can see how the employer might make poor investments and then there isn't enough money in the plan to pay out all the beneficiaries. Um, so the security is defi in defined benefit plans comes from knowing exactly how much will be paid in the end. A defined contribution plan means the employee assumes the risk. As a result, they're very popular with employers, maybe not so popular with employees. Well, I mean, they are popular with employees, but most employees would prefer to see more of these plans. And unfortunately, that doesn't seem to be the trend here. So when an employer actually has a defined benefit plan, the employer is required to buy insurance through the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation, PBGC. It's created to protect beneficiaries, the employees of defined benefit plans, when their employers are unable to meet their obligations. Sometimes businesses go belly up and they don't have enough money to pay out their beneficiaries, either because the company is struggling or perhaps um, uh, they've made some poor investments. And so they have to buy this insurance. And in this way, the employees will be covered even if the employer doesn't make good decisions. Defined contribution plans. So these are not the defined benefit plans, but these are, oops, wait a second. These are the ones where the employee assumes the risk are things like 401ks. Uh, there's a uh, other programs out there uh, for uh, governmental employees that functions very similar to 401ks. Profit sharing plans, stock bonus plans, uh, ESOPs, employee stock ownership plans, all of these are options, but we're going to focus on the 401k because this one is the rock star of the group. So what is a 401k? Well, it, 401k refers to the relevant section of the IRS code. Let's go ahead and look at this. I've just gone to uh, the Cornell Law website to pull up the statutes here. Let's just see what we've got here. And here we go. So we're in section 401, and we're just going to scroll on down to K. And you can see we are in... Um, uh, the uh, section 26, we're, so we're in the IRS section of the code, so we're actually looking at the tax code, and a 401k obviously is driven by tax law. It'll take me a while to find the K. So now we have B, C, D, E, F, G, H. We're almost there. I, J, K. Here we go. So this, when you hear people talk about 401ks, they're talking about from this space, or they're talking about the statute that's from this space. Here, let me just... This line down to T. 
to here. Go up here to the beginning. So this is about cash or deferred arrangements. And here's the general rule. A profit sharing or stock bonus plan, a pre-ERISA money purchase plan, or a rural cooperative plan shall not be considered as not satisfying the requirements of subsection A merely because the plan provides a quali qualified cash or deferment arrangement. And again, we're not going to go into here. These are, as you can see, very technical language, um, not very approachable, certainly not designed to be the easy reading that our summary plan descriptions have to be. Okay, as we said before, it's the most popular type of retirement plan currently in use. And again, the way that it becomes popular is by employers picking it. And then of course, it, then it requires that employees who work for that employer also deciding that this makes sense. And as you know, typically the plan allows eligible employees to make pre-tax elective deferrals of their income, typically through payroll deductions. And usually it's done through the payroll deduction where it's deducted from the, the pay that the employee would receive. So the employee kind of never actually touches that money. Uh, in many cases, an employer will match all or some portions of that, those uh, uh, contributions that the employee is making. And oftentimes the employee has the ability to uh, select a various uh, investment options, stocks, bonds, um, uh, managed funds, lots of different options under these circumstances. Uh, let's talk about the benefits that employees who use 401ks have. Well, the uh, tax qualified plans are covered by ERISA and the assets within them are generally protected from creditors of the account holder. So if I go bankrupt, the, my creditors aren't going to be able to get my 401k plan. Now, if I get a divorce or something like that, my, my 401k can be divided through a quattro uh, mechanism, qualified uh, domestic relations order. When an employee leaves a job, I can keep my 401k with my former employer or I can roll it over into another 401k account. It's a little bit tricky how to do that. If you don't do it the correct way, uh, you can uh, be responsible for the taxes right away. Um, the account money will have to start being drawn down when I he hit 70 years and one half, unless I am still employed with the company. And there's another version of 401k, which is called simple 401k, which is for small businesses. There's also Keo plans. This is named after the congressman who I recommend this. This is for self-employed um, individuals, so very small businesses, and it has it's a way to have a, uh, a simple pension plan under those circumstances. We're going to talk just briefly about the Verity Corp case. The issue in this case, and this is a U.S. Supreme Court decision, is did the employer and its subsidiary act as fiduciary, excuse me, ERISA, <laughs> did the employer and its subsidiary act as ERISA fiduciaries when they deliberately misled the plan, fiduciary, plan beneficiaries? Yes, and by doing so, they breached the fiduciary duties. Um, I'm not going to go into the facts, but just want to kind of give you this this bit. The Supreme Court decided that the employer was acting as an ERISA fiduciary when it misled its employees and for that reason it ruled in favor of the former employees. So what I'm trying to show here is that there's some teeth here that being the plan administrator for ERISA plans does not a carte blanche does not give employers the right to um, do things that are against the interest of the plan beneficiaries, the actual employees, the people who are going to be able to get the benefits. You don't need to know the name of this case, but you do need to know the idea that a fiduciary can't mislead the plan participants. So let's talk about reporting and disclosure. Well, as we already discussed a little bit about the summary plan description, I've attached, by the way, uh, another uh, 401k SPD, this one from Amazon. Uh, let's see. Go ahead and look at this one. Might take a second for it to download. Oh, 
Ah, here we go. This one isn't very fancy, not too splashy. Uh, so this is a little bit more like the chevron, maybe even a little bit less flashy than before. Ah, you can see the term is defined here. Uh, here, they say the the act was in 1974. Maybe I have it wrong on my slides. I apologize. I'm not going to test you on that. In addition to the summary plan description, each um, uh, plan needs to have an annual report with the Department of Labor. This is the U.S. Department of Labor. Um, benefits plans require 100% non-forfeitability uh, after three years of employment. So at that point, there can't be any take backs. Employers do have the right to reduce or modify employee benefits. So an employer isn't required to keep the same deductibles or the same premiums or the same level of coverage, say, for health insurance or vacation or things along those lines. In addition, similarly situated participants must be treated alike. So if an employer, if, if a particular treatment is held to be um, ineligible for compensation, for example, maybe it's an experimental drug or it's a, uh, there's a generic that, uh, the, um, that the plan is saying people have to take instead of the name brand drug. Well, you can't pick and choose. You can't say, well, Bob, you can take it, but Sally, you can't. Unless, of course, there's a difference in how these folks are situated. It may be that for Sally's illness, the generic's okay, but for Bob's illness, it isn't. That's going to depend upon the circumstances. So at this point, we're going to end the presentation. Um, in our next presentation, we'll cover HIPAA and uh, Obamacare and the COBRA and various other statutes. But at this point, we've gone through all of the ERISA material. I hope that it's been interesting to you. Um, uh, as always, if you have questions about the material, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. My email is cgroover at colin.edu. I'd be delighted to hear from you. Alternatively, please feel free to stop by or call me during my office hours. I'd be uh, happy to discuss these matters in more detail with you at that time as well. I thank you for your attention, and I hope that you have a wonderful day. Take care.